The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton Book Two, Chapter Six As became persons of their rising consequence, the Gormers were engaged in building a country house on Long Island, and it was a part of Miss Bart's duty to attend her hostess on frequent visits of inspection to the new estate. There, while Mrs. Gormer plunged into problems of lighting and sanitation, Lily had leisure to wander, in the bright autumn air, along the tree-fringed bay to which the land declined. Little as she was addicted to solitude, there had come to be moments when it seemed a welcome escape from the empty noises of her life. She was weary of being swept passively along a current of pleasure and business in which she had no share, weary of seeing other people pursue amusement and squander money, while she felt herself of no more account among them than an expensive toy in the hands of a spoiled child. It was in this frame of mind that, striking back from the shore one morning into the windings of an unfamiliar lane, she came suddenly upon the figure of George Dorset. The Dorset place was in the immediate neighbourhood of the Gormer's newly acquired estate, and in her motor flights thither with Mrs. Gormer, Lily had caught one or two passing glimpses of the couple, but they moved in so different an orbit that she had not considered the possibility of a direct encounter. Dorset, swinging along with bent head, in moody abstraction, did not see Miss Bart till he was close upon her, but the sight, instead of bringing him to a halt, as she had half expected, sent him toward her with an eagerness which found expression in his opening words. "'Miss Bart, you'll shake hands, won't you? I've been hoping to meet you. I should have written to you if I'd dared.' His face, with its tossed red hair and straggling moustache, had a driven, uneasy look, as though life had become an unceasing race between himself and the thoughts at his heels. The look drew a word of compassionate greeting from Lily, and he pressed on, as if encouraged by her tone. "'I wanted to apologize, to ask you to forgive me for the miserable part I played.' She checked him with a quick gesture. "'Don't let us speak of it. I was very sorry for you.' she said, with a tinge of disdain, which, as she instantly perceived, was not lost on him. He flushed to his haggard eyes, flushed so cruelly that she repented the thrust. "'You might well be. You don't know. You must let me explain. I was deceived, abominably deceived.' "'I am still more sorry for you, then,' she interposed, without irony. "'But you must see that I am not exactly the person with whom the subject can be discussed.' He met this with a look of genuine wonder. "'Why not? Isn't it to you, of all people, that I owe an explanation? No explanation is necessary. The situation was perfectly clear to me.' "'Ah!' he murmured, his head drooping again, and his irresolute hand switching at the underbrush along the lane. But as Lily made a movement to pass on, he broke out with fresh vehemence. "'Miss Bart, for God's sake, don't turn from me. We used to be good friends. You were always kind to me. And you don't know how I need a friend now.' The lamentable weakness of the words roused a motion of pity in Lily's breast. She, too, needed friends. She had tasted the pang of loneliness, and her resentment of Bertha Dorset's cruelty softened her heart to the poor wretch who was after all the chief of Bertha's victims. "'I still wish to be kind. I feel no ill-will toward you,' she said. "'But you must understand that after what has happened we can't be friends again. We can't see each other.' "'Ah, you are kind. You're merciful. You always were.' He fixed his miserable gaze on her. "'But why can't we be friends? Why not, when I've repented in dust and ashes?' Isn't it hard that you should condemn me to suffer for the falseness, the treachery of others? I was punished enough at the time. Is there to be no respite for me? I should have thought you had found complete respite in the reconciliation which was effected at my expense, Lily began, with renewed impatience. But he broke in imploringly. Don't put it that way. When that's been the worst of my punishment. My God! What could I do? Wasn't I powerless? You were singled out as a sacrifice. Any word I might have said would have been turned against you. I have told you I don't blame you. All I ask you to understand is that, after the use Bertha chose to make of me, after all that her behaviour has since implied, it's impossible that you and I should meet. 
he continued to stand before her, in his dogged weakness. "'Is it? Need it be? Mightn't there be circumstances?' He checked himself, slashing at the wayside weeds in wider radius. Then he began again. "'Miss Bart, listen. Give me a minute. If we're not to meet again, at least let me have a hearing now. You say we can't be friends after—after what has happened. But can't I at least appeal to your pity? Can't I move you if I ask you to think of me as a prisoner? A prisoner you alone can set free.' Lily's inward start betrayed itself in a quick blush. Was it possible that this was really the sense of Carrie Fisher's adumbrations? "'I can't see how I can possibly be of any help to you,' she murmured, drawing back a little from the mounting excitement of his look. Her tone seemed to sober him, as it had done so often in his stormiest moments. The stubborn lines of his face relaxed, and he said, with an abrupt drop to docility, "'You would see.' if you'd be as merciful as you used to be, and heaven knows I've never needed it more." She paused a moment, moved in spite of herself by this reminder of her influence over him. Her fibres had been softened by suffering, and the sudden glimpse into his mocked and broken life disarmed her contempt for his weakness. "'I am very sorry for you. I would help you willingly. But you must have other friends, other advisers." "'I never had a friend like you he answered simply. And besides, can't you see? You're the only person— his voice dropped to a whisper— the only person who knows. Again she felt her colour change. Again her heart rose in precipitate throbs to meet what she felt was coming. He lifted his eyes to her entreatingly. You do see, don't you? You understand. I'm desperate. I'm at the end of my tether. I want to be free, and you can free me. I know you can. You don't want to keep me bound fast in hell, do you? You can't want to take such a vengeance as that. You were always kind. Your eyes are kind now. You say you're sorry for me. Well, it rests with you to show it. And heaven knows there's nothing to keep you back. You understand, of course, there wouldn't be a hint of publicity, not a sound or a syllable to connect you with the thing. It would never come to that, you know. All I need is to be able to say definitely, I know this, and this, and this. And the fight would drop, and the way be cleared, and the whole abominable business swept out of sight in a second. He spoke pantingly, like a tired runner, with breaks of exhaustion between his words. And through the breaks she caught, as through the shifting rents of a fog, great golden vistas of peace and safety. For there was no mistaking the definite intention behind his vague appeal. She could have filled up the blanks without the help of Mrs. Fisher's insinuations. Here was a man who turned to her in the extremity of his loneliness and his humiliation. If she came to him at such a moment, he would be hers, with all the force of his deluded faith. And the power to make him so lay in her hand, lay there in a completeness he could not even remotely conjecture. Revenge and rehabilitation might be hers at a stroke. There was something dazzling in the completeness of the opportunity. She stood silent, gazing away from him down the autumnal stretch of the deserted lane. And suddenly, fear possessed her, fear of herself, and of the terrible force of the temptation. All her past weaknesses were like so many eager accomplices, drawing her toward the path their feet had already smoothed. She turned quickly and held out her hand to Dorset. "'Good-bye. I'm sorry. There's nothing in the world that I can do.' "'Nothing? Ah, oh, don't say that!' he cried. "'Say what's true, that you abandon me like the others. You, the only creature who could have saved me.' "'Good-bye. Good-bye,' she repeated hurriedly. And as she moved away she heard him cry out on a last note of entreaty. "'At least you'll let me see you once more.' Lily, on regaining the Gormer grounds, struck rapidly across the lawn toward the unfinished house, where she fancied that her hostess might be speculating, not too resignedly, on the cause of her delay. For like many unpunctual persons, Mrs. Gormer disliked to be kept waiting. 
As Miss Bart reached the avenue, however, she saw a smart phaeton with a high-stepping pair disappear behind the shrubbery in the direction of the gate, and on the doorstep stood Mrs. Gormer, with a glow of retrospective pleasure on her open countenance. At sight of Lily, the glow deepened to an embarrassed red, and she said with a slight laugh, "'Did you see my visitor? Oh, I thought you came back by the avenue. It was Mrs. George Dorset. She said she dropped in to make a neighborly call.' Lily met the announcement with her usual composure, though her experience of Bertha's idiosyncrasies would not have led her to include the neighborly instinct among them, and Mrs. Gormer, relieved to see that she gave no sign of surprise, went on with a deprecating laugh. Of course what really brought her was curiosity. She made me take her all over the house. But no one could have been nicer. No airs, you know, and so good-natured. I can quite see why people think her so fascinating." This surprising event, coinciding too completely with her meeting with Dorset to be regarded as contingent upon it, had yet immediately struck Lily with a vague sense of foreboding. It was not in Bertha's habits to be neighborly, much less to make advances to any one outside the immediate circle of her affinities. She had always consistently ignored the world of outer aspirants, or had recognized its individual members only when prompted by motives of self-interest. And the very capriciousness of her condescensions had, as Lily was aware, given them special value in the eyes of the person she distinguished. Lily saw this now in Mrs. Gormer's unconcealable complacency, and in the happy irrelevance with which, for the next day or two, she quoted Bertha's opinions and speculated on the origin of her gown. All the secret ambitions which Mrs. Gormer's native indolence, and the attitude of her companions, kept in habitual abeyance were now germinating afresh in the glow of Bertha's advances. And whatever the cause of the latter, Lily saw that, if they were followed up, they were likely to have a disturbing effect upon her own future. She had arranged to break the length of her stay with her new friends by one or two visits to other acquaintances as recent, and on her return from this somewhat depressing excursion, she was immediately conscious that Mrs. Dorset's influence was still in the air. There had been another exchange of visits— a tea at a country club, an encounter at a hunt ball. There was even a rumour of an approaching dinner, which Mattie Gormer, with an unnatural effort at discretion, tried to smuggle out of the conversation whenever Miss Bart took part in it. The latter had already planned to return to town after a farewell Sunday with her friends, and with Gertie Farish's aid, had discovered a small private hotel, where she might establish herself for the winter. The hotel being on the edge of a fashionable neighbourhood, the price of the few square feet she was to occupy was considerably in excess of her means, but she found a justification for her dislike of poorer quarters in the argument that, at this particular juncture, it was of the utmost importance to keep up a show of prosperity. In reality, it was impossible for her, while she had the means to pay her way for a week ahead, to lapse into a form of existence like Gertie Farish's. She had never been so near the brink of insolvency— but she could at least manage to meet her weekly hotel bill, and having settled the heaviest of her previous debts out of the money she had received from Trenor, she had still a fair margin of credit to go upon. The situation, however, was not agreeable enough to lull her to complete unconsciousness of its insecurity. Her rooms, with their cramped outlook down a sallow vista of brick walls and fire escapes, her lonely meals in the dark restaurant with its surcharged ceiling and haunting smell of coffee— all these material discomforts, which were yet to be accounted as so many privileges soon to be withdrawn, kept constantly before her the disadvantages of her state, and her mind reverted the more insistently to Mrs. Fisher's counsels. Beat about the question as she would, she knew the outcome of it was that she must try to marry Rosedale, and in this conviction she was fortified by an unexpected visit from George Dorset. She found him, on the first Sunday after her return to town, pacing her narrow sitting-room to the imminent peril of the few knick-knacks with which she had tried to disguise its plush exuberances. But the sight of her seemed to quiet him, and he said meekly that he hadn't come to bother her, that he asked only to be allowed to sit for half an hour, and talk of anything she liked. In reality, as she knew, he had but one subject—himself and his wretchedness, and it was the need of her sympathy that had drawn him back. But he began with a pretense of questioning her about herself— and as she replied, she saw that, for the first time, 
A faint realization of her plight penetrated the dense surface of his self-absorption. Was it possible that her old beast of an aunt had actually cut her off? That she was living alone like this because there was no one else for her to go to, and that she really hadn't more than enough to keep alive on, till the wretched little legacy was paid? The fibres of sympathy were nearly atrophied in him, but he was suffering so intensely that he had a faint glimpse of what other sufferings might mean, and, as she perceived, an almost simultaneous perception of the way in which her particular misfortunes might serve him. When at length she dismissed him, on the pretext that she must dress for dinner, he lingered entreatingly on the threshold to blurt out, "'It's been such a comfort. Do say you'll let me see you again.' But to this direct appeal it was impossible to give an assent, and she said with friendly decisiveness, "'I'm sorry, but you know why I can't.' He coloured to the eyes, pushed the door shut, and stood before her embarrassed but insistent. "'I know how you might.' if you would, if things were different. And it lies with you to make them so. It's just a word to say, and you put me out of my misery." Their eyes met, and for a second she trembled again with the nearness of the temptation. "'You are mistaken. I know nothing. I saw nothing!' she exclaimed, striving by sheer force of reiteration to build a barrier between herself and her peril. And as he turned away, groaning out, you sacrifice us both." She continued to repeat, as if it were a charm, "'I know nothing, absolutely nothing.'" Lily had seen little of Rosedale since her illuminating talk with Mrs. Fisher, but on the two or three occasions when they had met, she was conscious of having distinctly advanced in his favour. There could be no doubt that he admired her as much as ever, and she believed it rested with herself to raise his admiration to the point where it should bear down the lingering counsels of expediency. The task was not an easy one. But neither was it easy, in her long sleepless nights, to face the thought of what George Dorset was so clearly ready to offer. Baseness for baseness. She hated the other least. There were even moments when a marriage with Rosedale seemed the only honourable solution of her difficulties. She did not indeed let her imagination range beyond the day of plighting. After that, everything faded into a haze of material well-being, in which the personality of her benefactor remained mercifully vague. She had learned, in her long vigils, that there were certain things not good to think of, certain midnight images that must at any cost be exercised, and one of these was the image of herself as Rosedale's wife. Carrie Fisher— on the strength, as she frankly owned, of the bride's Newport success, had taken for the autumn months a small house at Tuxedo, and thither Lily was bound on the Sunday after Dorset's visit. Though it was nearly dinner-time when she arrived, her hostess was still out, and the firelit quiet of the small, silent house descended on her spirit with a sense of peace and familiarity. It may be doubted if such an emotion had ever before been evoked by Carrie Fisher's surroundings, but contrasted to the world in which Lily had lately lived, there was an air of repose and stability in the very placing of the furniture, and in the quiet competence of the parlour-maid, who led her up to her room. Mrs. Fisher's unconventionality was, after all, a merely superficial divergence from an inherited social creed, while the manners of the Gormer circle represented their first attempt to formulate such a creed for themselves. It was the first time since her return from Europe that Lily had found herself in a congenial atmosphere, and the stirring of familiar associations had almost prepared her, as she descended the stairs before dinner, to enter upon a group of her old acquaintances. But this expectation was instantly checked by the reflection that the friends who remained loyal were precisely those who would be least willing to expose her to such encounters, and it was hardly with surprise that she found, instead, Mr. Rosedale kneeling domestically on the drawing-room hearth before his hostess's little girl. Rosedale, in the paternal role, was hardly a figure to soften Lily, yet she could not but notice a quality of homely goodness in his advances to the child. They were not, at any rate, the premeditated and perfunctory endearments of the guest under his hostess's eye, for he and the little girl had the room to themselves, and something in his attitude made him seem a simple and kindly being, compared to the small critical creature who endured his homage. Yes, he would be kind. Lily, from the threshold, had time to feel— kind in his gross, unscrupulous, rapacious way, the way of the predatory creature with his mate. 
She had but a moment in which to consider whether this glimpse of the fireside man mitigated her repugnance, or gave it, rather, a more concrete and intimate form. For at sight of her, he was immediately on his feet again, the florid and dominant Rosedale of Mattie Gormer's drawing-room. It was no surprise to Lily to find that he had been selected as her only fellow-guest. Though she and her hostess had not met since the latter's tentative discussion of her future, Lily knew that the acuteness which enabled Mrs. Fisher to lay a safe and pleasant course through a world of antagonistic forces was not infrequently exercised for the benefit of her friends. It was, in fact, characteristic of Carrie, that while she actively gleaned her own stores from the field of affluence, her real sympathies were on the other side, with the unlucky, the unpopular, the unsuccessful, with all her hungry fellow-toilers in the shorn stubble of success. Mrs. Fisher's experience guarded her against the mistake of exposing Lily, for the first evening, to the unmitigated impression of Rosedale's personality. Kate Corby and two or three men dropped in to dinner, and Lily, alive to every detail of her friend's method, saw that such opportunities as had been contrived for her were to be deferred till she had, as it were, gained courage to make effectual use of them. She had a sense of acquiescing in this plan with the passiveness of a sufferer, resigned to the surgeon's touch, and this feeling of almost lethargic helplessness continued when, after the departure of the guests, Mrs. Fisher followed her upstairs. "'May I come in and smoke a cigarette over your fire? If we talk in my room we shall disturb the child.' Mrs. Fisher looked about her with the eye of the solicitous hostess. "'I hope you've managed to make yourself comfortable, dear. Isn't it a jolly little house? It's been such a blessing to have a few quiet weeks with the baby.' Carrie, in her rare moments of prosperity, became so expansively maternal that Miss Bart sometimes wondered whether, if she could ever get the time and money enough, she would not end by devoting them both to her daughter. "'It's a well-earned rest, I'll say that for myself,' she continued, sinking down with a sigh of content on the pillowed lounge near the fire. "'Louisa Bry is a stern taskmaster. I often used to wish myself back with the Gormers. Talk of love making people jealous and suspicious. It's nothing to social ambition. Louisa used to lie awake at night wondering whether the women who called on us called on me because I was with her, or on her because she was with me, and she was always laying traps to find out what I thought. Of course I had to disown my oldest friends, rather than let her suspect she owed me the chance of making a single acquaintance, when all the while that was what she had me there for, and what she wrote me a handsome cheque for when the season was over. Mrs. Fisher was not a woman who talked of herself without cause, and the practice of direct speech, far from precluding in her an occasional resort to circuitous methods, served rather, at crucial moments, the purpose of the juggler's chatter while he shifts the contents of his sleeves. Through the haze of her cigarette smoke, she continued to gaze meditatively at Miss Bart, who, having dismissed her maid, sat before the toilet-table shaking out over her shoulders the loosened undulations of her hair. "'Your hair's wonderful, Lily. Thinner? What does that matter when it's so light and alive? So many women's worries seem to go straight to their hair. But yours looks as if there had never been an anxious thought under it. I never saw you look better than you did this evening. Mattie Gormer told me that Morpeth wanted to paint you. Why don't you let him?" Miss Bart's immediate answer was to address a critical glance to the reflection of the countenance under discussion. Then she said, with a slight touch of irritation, "'I don't care to accept a portrait from Paul Morpeth.' Mrs. Fisher mused. "'No. And just now, especially. Well, he could do you after you are married.' She waited a moment, and then went on. "'By the way, I had a visit from Mattie the other day. She turned up here last Sunday, and with Bertha Dorset, of all people in the world. She paused again to measure the effect of this announcement on her hearer, but the brush in Miss Bart's lifted hand maintained its unwavering stroke from brow to nape. "'I was never more astonished,' Mrs. Fisher pursued. "'I don't know two women less predestined to intimacy—from Bertha's standpoint, that is. For, of course, poor Mattie thinks it natural enough that she should be singled out. I've no doubt the rabbit always thinks it is fascinating, the anaconda. Well, you know, I've always told you that Mattie secretly longed to bore herself with the really fashionable, and now that the chance has come, I see that she's capable of sacrificing all her old friends to it. 
Lily laid aside her brush, and turned a penetrating glance upon her friend. "'Including me?' she suggested. "'Ah, my dear,' murmured Mrs. Fisher, rising to push back a log from the hearth. "'That's what Bertha means, isn't it?' Miss Bart went on steadily. "'For, of course, she always means something. And before I left Long Island, I saw that she was beginning to lay her toils for Mattie.' Mrs. Fisher sighed evasively. She has her fast now, at any rate. To think of that loud independence of Mattie's being only a subtler form of snobbishness! Bertha can already make her believe anything she pleases. And I'm afraid she's begun, my poor child, by insinuating horrors about you." Lily flushed under the shadow of her drooping hair. "'The world is too vile,' she murmured, averting herself from Mrs. Fisher's anxious scrutiny. "'It's not a pretty place. And the only way to keep a footing in it is to fight it on its own terms. And above all, my dear, not alone.' Mrs. Fisher gathered up her floating implications in a resolute grasp. "'You've told me so little that I can only guess what has been happening. But in the rush we all live in there's no time to keep on hating any one without a cause. And if Bertha is still nasty enough to want to injure you with other people, it must be because she's still afraid of you.' From her standpoint, there's only one reason for being afraid of you. And my own idea is that, if you want to punish her, you hold the means in your hand. I believe you can marry George Dorset to-morrow. But if you don't care for that particular form of retaliation, the only thing to save you from Bertha is to marry somebody else. End of chapter 6 The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton. Book Two, Chapter Seven. The light projected on the situation by Mrs. Fisher had the cheerless distinctness of a winter dawn. It outlined the facts with a cold precision unmodified by shade or color, and refracted, as it were, from the blank walls of the surrounding limitations. She had opened windows from which no sky was ever visible. But the idealist subdued to vulgar necessities must employ vulgar minds to draw the inference to which he cannot stoop. And it was easier for Lily to let Mrs. Fisher formulate her case than to put it plainly to herself. Once confronted with it, however, she went the full length of its consequences. And these had never been more clearly present to her than when, the next afternoon, she set out for a walk with Rosedale. It was one of those still November days when the air is haunted with the light of summer, and something in the lines of the landscape, and in the golden haze which bathed them, recalled to Miss Bart the September afternoon when she had climbed the slopes of Bellamont with Selden. The importunate memory was kept before her by its ironic contrast to her present situation, since her walk with Selden had represented an irresistible flight from just such a climax as the present excursion was designed to bring about. But other memories important her also, the recollection of similar situations, as skilfully led up to, but through some malice of fortune, or her own unsteadiness of purpose, always failing of the intended result. Well, her purpose was steady enough now. She saw that the whole weary work of rehabilitation must begin again, and against far greater odds, if Bertha Dorset should succeed in breaking up her friendship with the Gormers and her longing for shelter and security was intensified by the passionate desire to triumph over Bertha, as only wealth and predominance could triumph over her. As the wife of Rosedale, the Rosedale she felt it in her power to create, she would at least present an invulnerable front to her enemy. She had to draw upon this thought, as upon some fiery stimulant, to keep up her part in the scene toward which Rosedale was too frankly tending. As she walked beside him, shrinking in every nerve from the way in which his look and tone made free of her, yet telling herself that this momentary endurance of his mood was the price she must pay for her ultimate power over him, she tried to calculate the exact point at which concession must turn to resistance, and the price he would have to pay be made equally clear to him. But his dapper self-confidence seemed impenetrable to such hints, and she had a sense of something hard and self-contained behind the superficial warmth of his manner. They had been seated for some time in the seclusion of a rocky glen above the lake, 
when she suddenly cut short the culmination of an impassioned period by turning upon him the grave loveliness of her gaze. "'I do believe what you say, Mr. Rosedale,' she said quietly, "'and I am ready to marry you whenever you wish.' Rosedale, reddening to the roots of his glossy hair, received this announcement with a recoil which carried him to his feet, where he halted before her in an attitude of almost comic discomfiture. "'For I suppose that is what you do wish,' she continued, in the same quiet tone. "'And, though I was unable to consent when you spoke to me in this way before, I am ready, now that I know you so much better, to trust my happiness to your hands.' She spoke with the noble directness which she could command on such occasions, and which was like a large, steady light thrown across the tortuous darkness of the situation. In its inconvenient brightness Rosedale seemed to waver a moment, as though conscious that every avenue of escape was unpleasantly illuminated. Then he gave a short laugh, and drew out a gold cigarette-case, in which, with plump jewelled fingers, he groped for a gold-tipped cigarette. Selecting one— he paused to contemplate it a moment before saying, "'My dear Miss Lily, I'm sorry if there's been any little misapprehension between us, but you made me feel my suit was so hopeless that I had really no intention of renewing it.' Lily's blood tingled with the grossness of the rebuff, but she checked the first leap of her anger, and said in a tone of gentle dignity, "'I have no one but myself to blame if I gave you the impression that my decision was final.' Her word-play was always too quick for him, and this reply held him in puzzled silence while she extended her hand and added, with the faintest inflection of sadness in her voice, "'Before we bid each other good-bye, I want at least to thank you for having once thought of me as you did.' The touch of her hand, the moving softness of her look, thrilled a vulnerable fibre in Rosedale. It was her exquisite inaccessibleness— the sense of distance she could convey without a hint of disdain, that made it most difficult for him to give her up. "'Why do you talk of saying good-bye? Ain't we going to be good friends all the same?' he urged, without releasing her hand. She drew it away quietly. "'What is your idea of being good friends?' she returned with a slight smile. "'Making love to me without asking me to marry you?' Rosedale laughed with a recovered sense of ease. "'Well, that's about the size of it, I suppose. I can't help making love to you. I don't see how any man could. But I don't mean to ask you to marry me as long as I can keep out of it.' She continued to smile. "'I like your frankness, but I am afraid our friendship can hardly continue on those terms.' She turned away as though to mark that its final term had in fact been reached, and he followed her for a few steps with a baffled sense of her having after all kept the game in her own hands. "'Miss Lily,' he began impulsively, but she walked on without seeming to hear him. He overtook her in a few quick strides, and laid an entreating hand on her arm. "'Miss Lily, don't hurry away like that. You're beastly hard on a fellow. But if you don't mind speaking the truth, I don't see why you shouldn't allow me to do the same.' She had paused a moment with raised brows, drawing away instinctively from his touch, though she made no effort to evade his words. "'I was under the impression,' she rejoined, "'that you had done so without waiting for my permission.' "'Well, why shouldn't you hear my reasons for doing it, then? "'We're neither of us such new hands that a little plain speaking is going to hurt us. "'I'm all broken up on you. There's nothing new in that. "'I'm more in love with you than I was this time last year. "'But I've got to face the fact that the situation is changed.' She continued to confront him with the same air of ironic composure— "'You mean to say that I'm not as desirable a match as you thought me?' "'Yes, that's what I do mean,' he answered resolutely. "'I won't go into what's happened. I don't believe the stories about you. I don't want to believe them. But they're there. And my not believing them ain't going to alter the situation.' She flushed to her temples, but the extremity of her need checked the retort on her lip, and she continued to face him composedly. "'If they are not true—' she said. Doesn't that alter the situation? He met this with a steady gaze of his small, stock-taking eyes, which made her feel herself no more than some superfine human merchandise. I believe it does in novels, 
but I'm certain it don't in real life. You know that as well as I do. If we're speaking the truth, let's speak the whole truth. Last year I was wild to marry you, and you wouldn't look at me. This year, well, you appear to be willing. Now what has changed in the interval? Your situation, that's all. Then you thought you could do better. Now you think you can, broke from her ironically. Why, yes, I do. In one way, that is. He stood before her, his hands in his pockets, his chest sturdily expanded under its vivid waistcoat. It's this way, you see. I've had a pretty steady grind of it these last years, working up my social position. Think it's funny I should say that. Why should I mind saying I want to get into society? A man ain't ashamed to say he wants to own a racing stable or a picture gallery. Well, a taste for society's just another kind of hobby. Perhaps I want to get even with some of the people who cold-shouldered me last year. Put it that way, if it sounds better. Anyhow, I want to have the run of the best houses. And I'm getting it, too, little by little. But I know the quickest way to queer yourself with the right people is to be seen with the wrong ones. And that's the reason I want to avoid mistakes. Miss Bart continued to stand before him in a silence that might have expressed either mockery or a half-reluctant respect for his candour, and after a moment's pause he went on, "'There it is, you see. I'm more in love with you than ever. But if I married you now, I'd queer myself for good and all, and everything I've worked for all these years would be wasted.' She received this with a look from which all tinge of resentment had faded. After the tissue of social falsehoods in which she had so long moved, it was refreshing to step into the open daylight of an avowed expediency. "'I understand you,' she said. "'A year ago I should have been of use to you, and now I should be an encumbrance. And I like you for telling me so quite honestly.' She extended her hand with a smile. Again the gesture had a disturbing effect upon Mr. Rosedale's self-command. "'By George! You're a dead-game sport, you are!' he exclaimed. And as she began once more to move away, he broke out suddenly, "'Miss Lily, stop! You know I don't believe those stories. I believe they were all got up by a woman who didn't hesitate to sacrifice you to her own convenience.' Lily drew away with a movement of quick disdain. It was easier to endure his insolence than his commiseration. "'You are very kind.' But I don't think we need discuss the matter farther." But Rosedale's natural imperviousness to hints made it easy for him to brush such resistance aside. "'I don't want to discuss anything. I just want to put a plain case before you,' he persisted. She paused in spite of herself, held by the note of a new purpose in his look and tone, and he went on, keeping his eyes firmly upon her. "'The wonder to me is that you've waited so long to get square with that woman when you've had the power in your hands." She continued silent under the rush of astonishment that his words produced, and he moved a step closer to ask with low-toned directness, "'Why don't you use those letters of hers you bought last year?' Lily stood speechless under the shock of the interrogation. In the words preceding it she had conjectured at most an allusion to her supposed influence over George Dorset. Nor did the astonishing indelicacy of the reference diminish the likelihood of Rosedale's resorting to it. But now she saw how far short of the mark she had fallen, and the surprise of learning that he had discovered the secret of the letters left her, for the moment, unconscious of the special use to which he was in the act of putting his knowledge. Her temporary loss of self-possession gave him time to press his point, and he went on quickly, as though to secure a completer control of the situation. You see, I know where you stand. I know how completely she's in your power. That sounds like stage talk, don't it? But there's a lot of truth in some of those old gags. And I don't suppose you bought those letters simply because you're collecting autographs." She continued to look at him with a deepening bewilderment. Her only clear impression resolved itself into a scared sense of his power. "'You're wondering how I found out about him,' he went on, answering her look with a note of conscious pride. Perhaps you've forgotten that I'm the owner of the Benedict. But never mind about that now. Getting on to things is a mighty useful accomplishment in business. And I've simply extended it to my private affairs. For this is partly my affair, you see. At least it depends on you to make it so. Let's look the situation straight in the eye. 
Mrs. Dorset, for reasons we needn't go into, did you a beastly bad turn last spring. Everybody knows what Mrs. Dorset is, and her best friends wouldn't believe her on oath where their own interests were concerned. But as long as they're out of the row, it's much easier to follow her lead than to set themselves against it, and you've simply been sacrificed to their laziness and selfishness. Isn't that a pretty fair statement of the case? Well, some people say you've got the neatest kind of an answer in your hands, that George Dorset would marry you to-morrow if you'd tell him all you know, and give him the chance to show the lady the door. I dare say he would. But you don't seem to care for that particular form of getting even. And taking a purely business view of the question, I think you're right. In a deal like that, nobody comes out with perfectly clean hands. And the only way for you to start fresh is to get Bertha Dorset to back you up, instead of trying to fight her." He paused long enough to draw breath, but not to give her time for the expression of her gathering resistance, and as he pressed on, expounding and elucidating his idea with the directness of the man who has no doubts of his cause, she found the indignation gradually freezing on her lip, found herself held fast in the grasp of his argument by the mere cold strength of its presentation. There was no time now to wonder how he had heard of her obtaining the letters. All her world was dark outside the monstrous glare of his scheme for using them. And it was not, after the first moment, the horror of the idea that held her spellbound, subdued to his will. It was rather its subtle affinity to her inmost cravings. He would marry her to-morrow, if she could regain Bertha Dorset's friendship. And to induce the open resumption of that friendship, and the tacit retraction of all that had caused its withdrawal, she had only to put to the lady the latent menace contained in the packet so miraculously delivered into her hands. Lily saw in a flash the advantage of this course over that which poor Dorset had pressed upon her. The other plan depended for its success on the infliction of an open injury, while this reduced the transaction to a private understanding, of which no third person need have the remotest hint. Put by Rosedale in terms of business-like give and take, this understanding took on the harmless air of a mutual accommodation like a transfer of property, or a revision of boundary lines. It certainly simplified life to view it as a perpetual adjustment, a play of party politics, in which every concession had its recognized equivalent. Lily's tired mind was fascinated by this escape from fluctuating ethical estimates, into a region of concrete weights and measures. Rosedale, as she listened, seemed to read in her silence not only a gradual acquiescence in his plan, but a dangerously far-reaching perception of the chances it offered. For as she continued to stand before him without speaking, he broke out, with a quick return upon himself. "'You see how simple it is, don't you? Well, don't be carried away by the idea that it's too simple. It isn't exactly as if you'd started in with a clean bill of health. Now we're talking, let's call things by their right names, and clear the whole business up. You know well enough that Bertha Dorset couldn't have touched you if there hadn't been, well, questions asked before, little points of interrogation, eh? Bound to happen to a good-looking girl with stingy relatives, I suppose. Anyhow, they did happen, and she found the ground prepared for her. Do you see where I'm coming out? You don't want these little questions cropping up again. It's one thing to get Bertha Dorset into line, but what you want is to keep her there. You can frighten her fast enough, but how are you going to keep her frightened? By showing her that you're as powerful as she is. All the letters in the world won't do that for you as you are now. But with a big backing behind you, you'll keep her just where you want her to be. That's my share in the business. That's what I'm offering you. You can't put the thing through without me. Don't run away with any idea that you can. In six months you'd be back again among your old worries, or worse ones. And here I am, ready to lift you out of them to-morrow, if you say so. Do you say so, Miss Lily? He added, moving suddenly nearer. The words, and the movement which accompanied them, combined to startle Lily out of the state of tranced subservience into which she had insensibly slipped. Light comes in devious ways to the groping consciousness, and it came to her now through the disgusted perception that her would-be accomplice assumed, as a matter of course, the likelihood of her distrusting him, and perhaps trying to cheat him of his share of the spoils. 
This glimpse of his inner mind seemed to present the whole transaction in a new aspect, and she saw that the essential baseness of the act lay in its freedom from risk. She drew back with a quick gesture of rejection, saying, in a voice that was a surprise to her own ears, "'You are mistaken, quite mistaken, both in the facts and in what you infer from them.' Rosedale stared a moment, puzzled by her sudden dash in a direction so different from that toward which she had appeared to be letting him guide her. "'Now what on earth does that mean? I thought we understood each other,' he exclaimed. And to her murmur of, "'Ah, we do now,' he retorted with a sudden burst of violence. "'I suppose it's because the letters are to him, then. Well, I'll be damned if I see what thanks you've got from him.' End of chapter 7 The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton Book 2, Chapter 8 The autumn days declined to winter. Once more the leisure world was in transition between country and town, and Fifth Avenue, still deserted at the weekend, showed from Monday to Friday a broadening stream of carriages between house-fronts, gradually restored to consciousness. The horse-show, some two weeks earlier, had produced a passing semblance of reanimation, filling the theatres and restaurants with a human display of the same costly and high-stepping kind as circled daily about its ring. In Miss Bart's world, the horse-show, and the public it attracted, had ostensibly come to be classed among the spectacles disdained of the elect. But as the feudal lord might sally forth to join in the dance on his village green, so society, unofficially and incidentally, still condescended to look in upon the scene. Mrs. Gormer, among the rest, was not above seizing such an occasion for the display of herself and her horses, and Lily was given one or two opportunities of appearing at her friend's side in the most conspicuous box the house afforded. But this lingering semblance of intimacy made her only the more conscious of a change in the relation between Mattie and herself, of a dawning discrimination, a gradually formed social standard, emerging from Mrs. Gormer's chaotic view of life. It was inevitable that Lily herself should constitute the first sacrifice to this new ideal, and she knew that, once the Gormers were established in town, the whole drift of fashionable life would facilitate Mattie's detachment from her. She had, in short, failed to make herself indispensable— or rather her attempt to do so had been thwarted by an influence stronger than any she could exert. That influence, in its last analysis, was simply the power of money. Bertha Dorset's social credit was based on an impregnable bank account. Lily knew that Rosedale had overstated neither the difficulty of her own position nor the completeness of the vindication he offered. Once Bertha's match in material resources, her superior gifts would make it easy for her to dominate her adversary. An understanding of what such domination would mean, and of the disadvantages accruing from her rejection of it, was brought home to Lily with increasing clearness during the early weeks of the winter. Hitherto she had kept up a semblance of movement outside the main flow of the social current, but with the return to town, and the concentrating of scattered activities, the mere fact of not slipping back naturally into her old habits of life marked her as being unmistakably excluded from them. If one were not a part of the season's fixed routine, one swung unsphered in a void of social non-existence. Lily, for all her dissatisfied dreaming, had never really conceived the possibility of revolving about a different centre. It was easy enough to despise the world, but decidedly different to find any other habitable region. Her sense of irony never quite deserted her, and she could still note, with self-directed derision, the abnormal value suddenly acquired by the most tiresome and insignificant details of her former life. Its very drudgeries had a charm now that she was involuntarily released from them. Card-leaving, note-writing, enforced civilities to the dull and elderly, and the smiling endurance of tedious dinners. How pleasantly such obligations would have filled the emptiness of her days! She did indeed leave cards in plenty. She kept herself, with a smiling and valiant persistence, well in the eye of her world. Nor did she suffer any of those gross rebuffs which sometimes produce a wholesome reaction of contempt in their victim. Society did not turn away from her. 
it simply drifted by, preoccupied and inattentive, letting her feel, to the full measure of her humbled pride, how completely she had been the creature of its favour. She had rejected Rosedale's suggestion with a promptness of scorn almost surprising to herself. She had not lost her capacity for high flashes of indignation. But she could not breathe long on the heights. There had been nothing in her training to develop any continuity of moral strength. What she craved, and really felt herself entitled to, was a situation in which the noblest attitude should also be the easiest. Hitherto her intermittent impulses of resistance had sufficed to maintain her self-respect. If she slipped, she recovered her footing, and it was only afterward that she was aware of having recovered it each time on a slightly lower level. She had rejected Rosedale's offer without conscious effort. Her whole being had risen against it. And she did not yet perceive that, by the mere act of listening to him, she had learned to live with ideas which would once have been intolerable to her. To Gertie Farish, keeping watch over her with a tenderer, if less discerning eye than Mrs. Fisher's, the results of the struggle were already distinctly visible. She did not, indeed, know what hostages Lily had already given to expediency, but she saw her passionately and irretrievably pledged to the ruinous policy of keeping up. Gertie could smile now at her own early dream of her friend's renovation through adversity. She understood clearly enough that Lily was not of those to whom privation teaches the unimportance of what they have lost. But this very fact, to Gertie, made her friend the more piteously in want of aid, the more exposed to the claims of a tenderness she was so little conscious of needing. Lily, since her return to town, had not often climbed Miss Farish's stairs. There was something irritating to her in the mute interrogation of Gertie's sympathy. She felt the real difficulties of her situation to be incommunicable to any one whose theory of values was so different from her own, and the restrictions of Gertie's life, which had once had the charm of contrast, now reminded her too painfully of the limits to which her own existence was shrinking. When at length one afternoon she put into execution the belated resolve to visit her friend, this sense of shrunken opportunities possessed her with unusual intensity. The walk up Fifth Avenue, unfolding before her, in the brilliance of the hard winter sunlight, an interminable procession of fastidiously equipped carriages, giving her, through the little squares of brougham windows, peeps of familiar profiles bent above visiting lists, of hurried hands dispensing notes and cards to attendant footmen, this glimpse of the ever-revolving wheels of the great social machine made Lily more than ever conscious of the steepness and narrowness of Gertie's stairs, and of the cramped, blind alley of life to which they led. Dull stairs destined to be mounted by dull people. How many thousands of insignificant figures were going up and down such stairs all over the world at that very moment! Figures as shabby and uninteresting as that of the middle-aged lady in limp black who descended Gertie's flight as Lily climbed to it. That was poor Miss Jane Silverton. She came to talk things over with me. She and her sister want to do something to support themselves, Gertie explained, as Lily followed her into the sitting-room. To support themselves? Are they so hard up? Miss Bart asked with a touch of irritation. She had not come to listen to the woes of other people. "'I'm afraid they have nothing left. Ned's debts have swallowed up everything. They had such hopes, you know, when he broke away from Carrie Fisher. They thought Bertha Dorset would be such a good influence, because she doesn't care for cards, and—well, she talked quite beautifully to poor Miss Jane about feeling as if Ned were her younger brother, and wanting to carry him off on the yacht, so that he might have a chance to drop cards and racing, and take up his literary work again." Miss Farish paused with a sigh which reflected the perplexity of her departing visitor. "'But that isn't all. It isn't even the worst. It seems that Ned has quarrelled with the Dorsets. Or at least Bertha won't allow him to see her. And he is so unhappy about it that he has taken to gambling again, and going about with all sorts of queer people. And Cousin Grace Van Osburgh accuses him of having a very bad influence on Freddy, who left Harvard last spring, and has been a great deal with Ned ever since. She sent for Miss Jane, and made a dreadful scene, and Jack Stepney and Herbert Melson, who were there too, told Miss Jane that Freddy was threatening to marry some dreadful woman to whom Ned had introduced him, and that they could do nothing with him because now he's of age he has his own money. You can fancy how poor Miss Jane felt. She came to me at once, 
and seemed to think that if I could get her something to do, she could earn enough to pay Ned's debts, and send him away. I'm afraid she has no idea how long it would take her to pay for one of his evenings at Bridge. And he was horribly in debt when he came back from the cruise. I can't see why he should have spent so much more money under Bertha's influence than Carrie's. Can you?" Lily met this query with an impatient gesture. "'My dear Gertie, I always understand how people can spend much more money, never how they can spend any less.' She loosened her furs and settled herself in Gertie's easy-chair, while her friend busied herself with the teacups. "'But what can they do, the Miss Silvertons? How do they mean to support themselves?' she asked, conscious that the note of irritation still persisted in her voice. It was the very last topic she had meant to discuss. It really did not interest her in the least. But she was seized by a sudden perverse curiosity to know how the two colourless, shrinking victims of young Silverton's sentimental experiments meant to cope with the grim necessity which lurked so close to her own threshold. "'I don't know. I am trying to find something for them. Miss Jane reads aloud very nicely. But it's so hard to find any one who is willing to be read to. And Miss Annie paints a little. Oh, I know. Apple blossoms on blotting paper. Just the kind of thing I shall be doing myself before long," exclaimed Lily, starting up with a vehemence of movement that threatened destruction to Miss Farish's fragile tea-table. Lily bent over to steady the cups. Then she sank back into her seat. I'd forgotten there was no room to dash about in. How beautifully one does have to behave in a small flat! Oh, Gertie, I wasn't meant to be good," she sighed out incoherently. Gertie lifted an apprehensive look to her pale face, in which the eyes shone with a peculiar sleepless luster. "'You look horribly tired, Lily. Take your tea, and let me give you this cushion to lean against.' Miss Bart accepted the cup of tea, but put back the cushion with an impatient hand. "'Don't give me that. I don't want to lean back. I shall go to sleep if I do.' "'Well, why not, dear? I'll be as quiet as a mouse,' Gertie urged affectionately. "'No, no, don't be quiet. Talk to me. Keep me awake. I don't sleep at night, and in the afternoon a dreadful drowsiness creeps over me.' "'You don't sleep at night? Since when?' "'I don't know. I can't remember.' She rose and put the empty cup on the tea-tray. "'Another, and stronger, please. If I don't keep awake now I shall see horrors to-night. Perfect horrors.' "'But they'll be worse if you drink too much tea.' "'No. No, give it to me. And don't preach, please,' Lily returned imperiously. Her voice had a dangerous edge, and Gertie noticed that her hand shook as she held it out to receive the second cup. "'But you look so tired. I'm sure you must be ill.' Miss Bart set down her cup with a start. "'Do I look ill? Does my face show it?' She rose and walked quickly toward the little mirror above the writing-table. "'What a horrid looking-glass! It's all blotched and discoloured. Any one would look ghastly in it.' She turned back, fixing her plaintive eyes on Gertie. "'You stupid dear! Why do you say such odious things to me? It's enough to make one ill to be told one looks so. And looking ill means looking ugly.' She caught Gertie's wrists, and drew her close to the window. "'After all, I'd rather know the truth. Look me straight in the face, Gertie, and tell me. Am I perfectly frightful?' "'You're perfectly beautiful now, Lily. Your eyes are shining, and your cheeks have grown so pink all of a sudden. Ah! They were pale, then, ghastly pale, when I came in. Why don't you tell me frankly that I'm a wreck?' My eyes are bright now because I'm so nervous, but in the mornings they look like lead. And I can see lines coming in my face, the lines of worry and disappointment and failure. Every sleepless night leaves a new one. And how can I sleep, when I have such dreadful things to think about?" "'Dreadful things? What things?' asked Gertie, gently detaching her wrists from her friend's feverish fingers. "'What things? Well. Poverty, for one, and I don't know any that's more dreadful." Lily turned away and sank with sudden weariness into the easy-chair near the tea-table. "'You asked me just now if I could understand why Ned Silverton spent so much money. Of course I understand. He spends it on living with the rich. You think we live on the rich, rather than with them. 
and so we do in a sense. But it's a privilege we have to pay for. We eat their dinners, and drink their wine, and smoke their cigarettes, and use their carriages and their opera boxes and their private cars. Yes, but there's a tax to pay on every one of those luxuries. The man pays it by big tips to the servants, by playing cards beyond his means, by flowers and presents, and—and and lots of other things that cost. The girl pays it by tips and cards, too. Oh, yes, I've had to take up bridge again. And by going to the best dressmakers, and having just the right dress for every occasion, and always keeping herself fresh and exquisite and amusing. She leaned back for a moment, closing her eyes. And as she sat there, her pale lips slightly parted, and the lids dropped above her fagged, brilliant gaze. Gertie had a startled perception of the change in her face, of the way in which an ashen daylight seemed suddenly to extinguish its artificial brightness. She looked up, and the vision vanished. It doesn't sound very amusing, does it? And it isn't. I'm sick to death of it. And yet the thought of giving it all up nearly kills me. It's what keeps me awake at night, and makes me so crazy for your strong tea. For I can't go on in this way much longer, you know. I'm nearly at the end of my tether. And then what can I do? How on earth am I to keep myself alive? I see myself reduced to the fate of that poor Silverton woman, slinking about to employment agencies, and trying to sell painted blotting-pads to women's exchanges. And there are thousands and thousands of women trying to do the same thing already, and not one of the number who has less idea how to earn a dollar than I have." She rose again with a hurried glance at the clock. "'It's late, and I must be off. I have an appointment with Carrie Fisher. Don't look so worried, you dear thing. Don't think too much about the nonsense I've been talking." She was before the mirror again, adjusting her hair with a light hand drawing down her veil, and giving a dexterous touch to her furs. "'Of course, you know, it hasn't come to the employment agencies and the painted blotting-pads yet. But I'm rather hard up just for the moment. And if I could find something to do—notes to write, and visiting lists to make up, or that kind of thing—it would tide me over till the legacy is paid. And Carrie has promised to find somebody who wants a kind of social secretary. You know she makes a specialty of the helpless rich.' Miss Bart had not revealed to Gertie the full extent of her anxiety. She was, in fact, in urgent and immediate need of money—money to meet the vulgar weekly claims which could neither be deferred nor evaded. To give up her apartment, and shrink to the obscurity of a boarding-house, or the provisional hospitality of a bed in Gertie Farish's sitting-room, was an expedient which could only postpone the problem confronting her and it seemed wiser as well as more agreeable to remain where she was, and find some means of earning her living. The possibility of having to do this was one which she had never before seriously considered, and the discovery that, as a breadwinner, she was likely to prove as helpless and ineffectual as poor Miss Silverton, was a severe shock to her self-confidence. Having been accustomed to take herself at the popular valuation, as a person of energy and resource, naturally fitted to dominate any situation in which she found herself, she vaguely imagined that such gifts would be of value to seekers after social guidance but there was unfortunately no specific head under which the art of saying and doing the right thing could be offered in the market, and even Mrs. Fisher's resourcefulness failed before the difficulty of discovering a workable vein in the vague wealth of Lily's graces. Mrs. Fisher was full of indirect expedients for enabling her friends to earn a living, and could conscientiously assert that she had put several opportunities of this kind before Lily, but more legitimate methods of bread-winning were as much out of her line as they were beyond the capacity of the sufferers she was generally called upon to assist. Lily's failure to profit by the chances already afforded her might, moreover, have justified the abandonment of farther effort on her behalf. But Mrs. Fisher's inexhaustible good nature made her an adept at creating artificial demands in response to an actual supply. In the pursuance of this end, she at once started on a voyage of discovery in Miss Bart's behalf, and as the result of her explorations, she now summoned the latter with the announcement that she had found something. Left to herself, Gertie mused distressfully upon her friend's plight, and her own inability to relieve it. It was clear to her that Lily, for the present, had no wish for the kind of help she could give. Miss Farish could see no hope for her friend but in a life completely reorganized and detached from its old associations, whereas all Lily's energies were centered in the determined effort to hold fast to those associations, to keep herself visibly identified with them, 
as long as the illusion could be maintained. Pitiable as such an attitude seemed to Gertie, she could not judge it as harshly as Selden, for instance, might have done. She had not forgotten the night of emotion when she and Lily had lain in each other's arms, and she had seemed to feel her very heart's blood passing into her friend. The sacrifice she had made seemed unveiling enough. No trace remained in Lily of the subdued influences of that hour. But Gertie's tenderness, disciplined by long years of contact with obscure and inarticulate suffering, could wait on its object with a silent forbearance which took no account of time. She could not, however, deny herself the solace of taking anxious counsel with Lawrence Selden, with whom, since his return from Europe, she had renewed her old relation of cousinly confidence. Selden himself had never been aware of any change in their relation. He found Gertie as he had left her, simple, undemanding, and devoted, but with a quickened intelligence of the heart which she recognized without seeking to explain it. To Gertie herself it would once have seemed impossible that she should ever again talk freely with him of Lily Bart. But what had passed in the secrecy of her own breast seemed to resolve itself, when the mist of the struggle cleared, into a breaking down of the bounds of self, a deflecting of the wasted personal emotion into the general current of human understanding. It was not till some two weeks after her visit from Lily that Gertie had the opportunity of communicating her fears to Selden. The latter, having presented himself on a Sunday afternoon, had lingered on through the dowdy animation of his cousin's tea-hour, conscious of something in her voice and eye which solicited a word apart, and as soon as their last visitor was gone, Gertie opened her case by asking how lately he had seen Miss Bart. Selden's perceptible pause gave her time for a slight stir of surprise. "'I haven't seen her at all. I've perpetually missed seeing her since she came back.' This unexpected admission made Gertie pause, too and she was still hesitating on the brink of her subject when he relieved her by adding, "'I've wanted to see her, but she seems to have been absorbed by the Gormer set since her return from Europe.' "'That's all the more reason. She's been very unhappy.' "'Unhappy at being with the Gormers?' "'Oh, I don't defend her intimacy with the Gormers. But that, too, is at an end now, I think. You know people have been very unkind since Bertha Dorset quarrelled with her.' "'Ah!' Selden exclaimed, rising abruptly to walk to the window, where he remained with his eyes on the darkening street while his cousin continued to explain. "'Judy Trenner and her own family have deserted her, too, and all because Bertha Dorset has said such horrible things. And she is very poor. You know Mrs. Peniston cut her off with a small legacy, after giving her to understand that she was to have everything.' "'Yes, I know,' Selden assented curtly turning back into the room, but only to stir about with restless steps in the circumscribed space between door and window. Yes, she's been abominably treated, but it's unfortunately the precise thing that a man who wants to show his sympathy can't say to her. His words caused Gertie a slight chill of disappointment. There would be other ways of showing your sympathy, she suggested. Selden, with a slight laugh, sat down beside her on the little sofa, which projected from the hearth. "'What are you thinking of, you incorrigible missionary?' he asked. Gertie's colour rose, and her blush was for a moment her only answer. Then she made it more explicit by saying, "'I am thinking of the fact that you and she used to be great friends, that she used to care immensely for what you thought of her, and that if she takes your staying away as a sign of what you think now, I can imagine it's adding a great deal to her unhappiness.' "'My dear child,' Don't add to it still more, at least to your conception of it, by attributing to her all sorts of susceptibilities of your own. Selden, for his life, could not keep a note of dryness out of his voice, but he met Gertie's look of perplexity by saying more mildly, But though you immensely exaggerate the importance of anything I could do for Miss Bart, you can't exaggerate my readiness to do it, if you ask me to. He laid his hand for a moment on hers and there passed between them, on the current of the rare contact, one of those exchanges of meaning which fill the hidden reservoirs of affection. Gertie had the feeling that he measured the cost of her request, as plainly as she read the significance of his reply, and the sense of all that was suddenly clear between them made her next words easier to find. "'I do ask you, then. I ask you because she once told me that you had been a help to her, and because she needs help now as she has never needed it before.' You know how dependent she has always been on ease and luxury, how she has hated what was shabby and ugly and uncomfortable. She can't help it. She was brought up with those ideas, and has never been able to find her way out of them. 
But now all the things she cared for have been taken from her, and the people who taught her to care for them have abandoned her too. And it seems to me that if someone could reach out a hand, and show her the other side, show her how much is left in life and in herself— Gertie broke off, abashed at the sound of her own eloquence, and impeded by the difficulty of giving precise expression to her vague yearning for her friend's retrieval. "'I can't help her myself. She's passed out of my reach,' she continued. "'I think she's afraid of being a burden to me. When she was last here two weeks ago, she seemed dreadfully worried about her future. She said Carrie Fisher was trying to find something for her to do. A few days later she wrote me that she had taken a position as private secretary, and that I was not to be anxious, for everything was all right, and she would come in and tell me about it when she had time. But she has never come, and I don't like to go to her, because I am afraid of forcing myself on her when I'm not wanted. Once when we were children, and I had rushed up after a long separation, and thrown my arms about her, she said, "'Please don't kiss me unless I ask you to, Gertie.' And she did ask me, a minute later— but since then I've always waited to be asked." Selden had listened in silence, with the concentrated look which his thin, dark face could assume when he wished to guard it against involuntary change of expression. When his cousin ended, he said with a slight smile, "'Since you've learned the wisdom of waiting, I don't see why you urge me to rush in.' But the troubled appeal of her eyes made him add, as he rose to take leave, "'Still, I'll do what you wish, and not hold you responsible for my failure.' Selden's avoidance of Miss Bart had not been as unintentional as he had allowed his cousin to think. At first, indeed, while the memory of their last hour at Monte Carlo still held the full heat of his indignation, he had anxiously watched for her return. But she had disappointed him by lingering in England, and when she finally reappeared it happened that business had called him to the West, whence he came back only to learn that she was starting for Alaska with the Gormers. The revelation of this suddenly established intimacy effectually chilled his desire to see her. If, at a moment when her whole life seemed to be breaking up, she could cheerfully commit its reconstruction to the Gormers, there was no reason why such accidents should ever strike her as irreparable. Every step she took seemed in fact to carry her farther from the region where, once or twice, he and she had met for an illumined moment. And the recognition of this fact, when its first pang had been surmounted, produced in him a sense of negative relief. It was much simpler for him to judge Miss Bart by her habitual conduct than by the rare deviations from it which had thrown her so disturbingly in his way, and every act of hers which made the recurrence of such deviations more unlikely, confirmed the sense of relief with which he returned to the conventional view of her. But Gertie Farish's words had sufficed to make him see how little this view was really his, and how impossible it was for him to live quietly with the thought of Lily Bart. To hear that she was in need of help, even such vague help as he could offer, was to be at once repossessed by that thought, and by the time he reached the street he had sufficiently convinced himself of the urgency of his cousin's appeal, to turn his steps directly toward Lily's hotel. There his zeal met a check in the unforeseen news that Miss Bart had moved away, but, on his pressing his enquiries, the clerk remembered that she had left an address, for which he presently began to search through his books. It was certainly strange that she should have taken this step without letting Gertie Farish know of her decision, and Selden waited with a vague sense of uneasiness while the address was sought for. The process lasted long enough for uneasiness to turn to apprehension, but when at length a slip of paper was handed to him, and he read on it, "'Care of Mrs. Norma Hatch, Emporium Hotel,' his apprehension passed into an incredulous stare, and this into the gesture of disgust with which he tore the paper in two— and turned to walk quickly homeward. End of chapter 8 The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton Book 2, Chapter 9 When Lily woke on the morning after her translation to the Emporium Hotel, her first feeling was one of purely physical satisfaction. The force of contrast gave an added keenness to the luxury of lying once more in a soft pillowed bed, and looking across a spacious sunlit room at a breakfast-table set invitingly near the fire. Analysis and introspection might come later, but for the moment she was not even troubled by the excesses of the upholstery or the restless convolutions of the furniture. The sense of being once more lapped and folded in ease, as in some dense, mild medium impenetrable to discomfort, effectually stilled the faintest note of criticism. 
When, the afternoon before, she had presented herself to the lady to whom Carrie Fisher had directed her, she had been conscious of entering a new world. Carrie's vague presentiment of Mrs. Norma Hatch, whose reversion to her Christian name was explained as the result of her latest divorce, left her under the implication of coming from the West, with the not unusual extenuation of having brought a great deal of money with her. She was, in short, rich, helpless, unplaced, the very subject for Lily's hand. Mrs. Fisher had not specified the line her friend was to take. She owned herself unacquainted with Mrs. Hatch, whom she knew about through Melville Stancy, a lawyer in his leisure moments, and the Falstaff of a certain section of festive club life. Socially, Mr. Stancy might have been said to form a connecting link between the Gormer world and the more dimly lit region on which Miss Bart now found herself entering. It was, however, only figuratively that the illumination of Mrs. Hatch's world could be described as dim. In actual fact, Lily found her seated in a blaze of electric light, impartially projected from various ornamental excrescences, on a vast concavity of pink damask and gilding, from which she rose like Venus from her shell. The analogy was justified by the appearance of the lady, whose large-eyed prettiness had the fixity of something impaled and shone under glass. This did not preclude the immediate discovery that she was some years younger than her visitor, and that under her showiness, her ease, the aggression of her dress and voice, there persisted that ineradicable innocence which, in ladies of her nationality, so curiously coexists with startling extremes of experience. The environment in which Lily found herself was as strange to her as its inhabitants. She was unacquainted with the world of the fashionable New York hotel, a world overheated, over-upholstered, and over-fitted with mechanical appliances for the gratification of fantastic requirements, while the comforts of a civilized life were as unattainable as in a desert. Through this atmosphere of torrid splendor moved wan beings as richly upholstered as the furniture, beings without definite pursuits or permanent relations, who drifted on a languid tide of curiosity from restaurant to concert-hall, from palm-garden to music-room, from art-exhibit to dressmaker's opening. High-stepping horses or elaborately equipped motors waited to carry these ladies into vague metropolitan distances, whence they returned, still more wan from the weight of their sables, to be sucked back into the stifling inertia of the hotel routine. Somewhere behind them, in the background of their lives, there was doubtless a real past, peopled by real human activities. They themselves were probably the product of strong ambitions, persistent energies, diversified contacts with the wholesome roughness of life, yet they had no more real existence than the poet's shades in limbo. Lily had not been long in this pallid world without discovering that Mrs. Hatch was its most substantial figure. That lady, though still floating in the void, showed faint symptoms of developing an outline, and in this endeavour she was actively seconded by Mr. Melville Stancy. It was Mr. Stancy, a man of large resounding presence, suggestive of convivial occasions, and of a chivalry finding expression in first-night boxes and thousand-dollar bonbonnières, who had transplanted Mrs. Hatch from the scene of her first development to the higher stage of hotel life in the metropolis. It was he who had selected the horses with which she had taken the blue ribbon at the show, had introduced her to the photographer whose portraits of her formed the recurring ornament of Sunday supplements, and had got together the group which constituted her social world. It was a small group still, with heterogeneous figures suspended in large unpeopled spaces, but Lily did not take long to learn that its regulation was no longer in Mr. Stancy's hands. As often happens, the pupil had outstripped the teacher, and Mrs. Hatch was already aware of heights of elegance as well as depths of luxury beyond the world of the emporium. This discovery at once produced in her a craving for higher guidance, and for the adroit feminine hand which should give the right turn to her correspondence, the right look to her hats, the right succession to the items of her menus. It was, in short, as the regulator of a germinating social life, that Miss Bart's guidance was required, her ostensible duties as secretary being restricted by the fact that Mrs. Hatch, as yet, knew hardly any one to write to. The daily details of Mrs. Hatch's existence were as strange to Lily as its general tenor. The lady's habits were marked by an oriental indolence and disorder peculiarly trying to her companion. Mrs. Hatch and her friends seemed to float together outside the bounds of time and space. No definite hours were kept, no fixed obligations existed, 
Night and day flowed into one another in a blur of confused and retarded engagements, so that one had the impression of lunching at the tea-hour, while dinner was often merged in the noisy after-theatre supper, which prolonged Mrs. Hatch's vigil till daylight. Through this jumble of futile activities came and went a strange throng of hangers-on, manicures, beauty-doctors, hairdressers, teachers of bridge, of French, of physical development, figures sometimes indistinguishable, by their appearance, or by Mrs. Hatch's relation to them, from the visitors constituting her recognized society. But strangest of all to Lily was the encounter, in this latter group, of several of her acquaintances. She had supposed, and not without relief, that she was passing for the moment completely out of her own circle. But she found that Mr. Stancy, one side of whose sprawling existence overlapped the edge of Mrs. Fisher's world, had drawn several of its brightest ornaments into the circle of the emporium. To find Ned Silverton among the habitual frequenters of Mrs. Hatch's drawing-room was one of Lily's first astonishments, but she soon discovered that he was not Mr. Stancy's most important recruit. It was on little Freddy Van Osburgh, the small, slim heir of the Van Osburgh millions, that the attention of Mrs. Hatch's group was centred. Freddy, barely out of college, had risen above the horizon since Lily's eclipse, and she now saw with surprise what an effulgence he shed on the outer twilight of Mrs. Hatch's existence. This, then, was one of the things that young men went in for, when released from the official social routine. This was the kind of previous engagement that so frequently caused them to disappoint the hopes of anxious hostesses. Lily had an odd sense of being behind the social tapestry, on the side where the threads were knotted and the loose ends hung. For a moment she found a certain amusement in the show, and in her own share of it. The situation had an ease and unconventionality distinctly refreshing, after her experience of the irony of conventions. But these flashes of amusement were but brief reactions from the long disgust of her days. Compared with the vast gilded void of Mrs. Hatch's existence, the life of Lily's former friends seemed packed with ordered activities. Even the most irresponsible pretty woman of her acquaintance had her inherited obligations, her conventional benevolences, her share in the working of the great civic machine, and all hung together in the solidarity of these traditional functions. The performance of specific duties would have simplified Miss Bart's position, but the vague attendance on Mrs. Hatch was not without its perplexities. It was not her employer who created these perplexities. Mrs. Hatch showed from the first an almost touching desire for Lily's approval. Far from asserting the superiority of wealth, her beautiful eyes seemed to urge the plea of inexperience. She wanted to do what was nice, to be taught how to be lovely. The difficulty was to find any point of contact between her ideals and Lily's. Mrs. Hatch swam in a haze of indeterminate enthusiasms, of aspirations culled from the stage, the newspapers, the fashion journals, and a gaudy world of sport still more completely beyond her companion's ken. To separate from these confused conceptions those most likely to advance the lady on her way was Lily's obvious duty. But its performance was hampered by rapidly growing doubts. Lily was in fact becoming more and more aware of a certain ambiguity in her situation. It was not that she had, in the conventional sense, any doubt of Mrs. Hatch's irreproachableness. The lady's offences were always against taste rather than conduct. Her divorce record seemed due to geographical rather than ethical conditions, and her worst laxities were likely to proceed from a wandering and extravagant good nature. But if Lily did not mind her detaining her manicure for luncheon, or offering the beauty doctor a seat in Freddy Van Osburgh's box at the play, she was not equally at ease in regard to some less apparent lapses from convention. Ned Silverton's relation to Stancy seemed, for instance, closer and less clear than any natural affinities would warrant and both appeared united in the effort to cultivate Freddy Van Osburgh's growing taste for Mrs. Hatch. There was as yet nothing definable in the situation, which might well resolve itself into a huge joke on the part of the other two. But Lily had a vague sense that the subject of their experiment was too young, too rich, and too credulous. Her embarrassment was increased by the fact that Freddy seemed to regard her as cooperating with himself in the social development of Mrs. Hatch, a view that suggested, on his part, a permanent interest in the lady's future. There were moments when Lily found an ironic amusement in this aspect of the case. The thought of launching such a missile as Mrs. Hatch at the perfidious bosom of society was not without its charm. Miss Bart had even beguiled her leisure with visions of the fair Norma, introduced for the first time to a family banquet at the Van Osburghs. 
But the thought of being personally connected with the transaction was less agreeable, and her momentary flashes of amusement were followed by increasing periods of doubt. The sense of these doubts was uppermost when, late one afternoon, she was surprised by a visit from Lawrence Selden. He found her alone in the wilderness of pink damask, for in Mrs. Hatch's world the tea-hour was not dedicated to social rights, and the lady was in the hands of her masseuse. Selden's entrance had caused Lily an inward start of embarrassment, but his air of constraint had the effect of restoring her self-possession, and she took at once the tone of surprise and pleasure, wondering frankly that he should have traced her to so unlikely a place, and asking what had inspired him to make the search. Selden met this with an unusual seriousness. She had never seen him so little master of the situation, so plainly at the mercy of any obstruction she might put in his way. "'I wanted to see you,' he said, and she could not resist observing in reply that he had kept his wishes under remarkable control. She had in truth felt his long absence as one of the chief bitternesses of the last months. His desertion had wounded sensibilities far below the surface of her pride. Selden met the challenge with directness. "'Why should I have come, unless I thought I could be of use to you? It is my only excuse for imagining you could want me.' This struck her as a clumsy evasion, and the thought gave a flash of keenness to her answer. "'Then you have come now because you think you can be of use to me?' He hesitated again. "'Yes, in the modest capacity of a person to talk things over with.' For a clever man it was certainly a stupid beginning, and the idea that his awkwardness was due to the fear of her attaching a personal significance to his visit chilled her pleasure in seeing him. Even under the most adverse conditions, that pleasure always made itself felt. She might hate him, but she had never been able to wish him out of the room. She was very near hating him now, yet the sound of his voice, the way the light fell on his thin dark hair, the way he sat and moved and wore his clothes— she was conscious that even these trivial things were inwoven with her deepest life. In his presence a sudden stillness came upon her, and the turmoil of her spirit ceased. But an impulse of resistance to this stealing influence now prompted her to say, "'It's very good of you to present yourself in that capacity. But what makes you think I have anything particular to talk about?' Though she kept the even tone of light intercourse, the question was framed in a way to remind him that his good offices were unsought, and for a moment Selden was checked by it. The situation between them was one which could have been cleared up only by a sudden explosion of feeling, and their whole training and habit of mind were against the chances of such an explosion. Selden's calmness seemed rather to harden into resistance, and Miss Bart's into a surface of glittering irony, as they faced each other from the opposite corners of one of Mrs. Hatch's elephantine sofas. The sofa in question, and the apartment peopled by its monstrous mates, served at length to suggest the turn of Selden's reply. "'Gertie told me that you were acting as Mrs. Hatch's secretary, and I knew she was anxious to hear how you were getting on.' Miss Bart received this explanation without perceptible softening. "'Why didn't she look me up herself, then?' she asked. "'Because, as you didn't send her your address, she was afraid of being importunate.' Selden continued with a smile. "'You see no such scruples restrained me. But then I haven't as much to risk if I incur your displeasure.' Lily answered his smile. "'You haven't incurred it as yet. But I have an idea that you are going to.' "'That rests with you, doesn't it? You see my initiative doesn't go beyond putting myself at your disposal.' "'But in what capacity? What am I to do with you?' she asked in the same light tone. Selden again glanced about Mrs. Hatch's drawing-room. Then he said, with a decision which he seemed to have gathered from this final inspection, "'You are to let me take you away from here.' Lily flushed at the suddenness of the attack. Then she stiffened under it and said coldly, "'And may I ask where you mean me to go?' "'Back to Gertie in the first place, if you will. The essential thing is that it should be away from here.' The unusual harshness of his tone might have shown her how much the words cost him, but she was in no state to measure his feelings while her own were in a flame of revolt. To neglect her, perhaps even to avoid her, at a time when she had most need of her friends, and then suddenly and unwarrantably to break into her life with this strange assumption of authority, was to rouse in her every instinct of pride and self-defence. "'I am very much obliged to you,' 
she said, for taking such an interest in my plans. But I am quite contented where I am, and have no intention of leaving. Selden had risen, and was standing before her in an attitude of uncontrollable expectancy. "'That simply means that you don't know where you are!' he exclaimed. Lily rose also, with a quick flash of anger. "'If you have come here to say disagreeable things about Mrs. Hatch, it is only with your relation to Mrs. Hatch that I am concerned. My relation to Mrs. Hatch is one I have no reason to be ashamed of. She has helped me to earn a living when my old friends were quite resigned to seeing me starve. Nonsense! Starvation is not the only alternative. You know you can always find a home with Gertie till you are independent again. You show such an intimate acquaintance with my affairs, that I suppose you mean till my aunt's legacy is paid. I do mean that. Gertie told me of it. Selden acknowledged without embarrassment. He was too much in earnest now to feel any false constraint in speaking his mind. "'But Gertie does not happen to know,' Miss Bart rejoined, "'that I owe every penny of that legacy.' "'Good God!' Selden exclaimed, startled out of his composure by the abruptness of the statement. "'Every penny of it, and more, too,' Lily repeated. "'And you now perhaps see why I prefer to remain with Mrs. Hatch, rather than take advantage of Gertie's kindness. I have no money left, except my small income, and I must earn something more to keep myself alive.' Selden hesitated a moment. Then he rejoined in a quieter tone. "'But with your income and Gertie's, since you allow me to go so far into the details of the situation, you and she could surely contrive a life together which would put you beyond the need of having to support yourself. Gertie, I know, is eager to make such an arrangement, and would be quite happy in it. But I should not,' Miss Bart interposed. "'There are many reasons why it would be neither kind to Gertie, nor wise for myself.' She paused a moment, and as he seemed to await a further explanation, added with a quick lift of her head, "'You will perhaps excuse me from giving you these reasons.' "'I have no claim to know them,' Selden answered, ignoring her tone. "'No claim to offer any comment or suggestion beyond the one I have already made. And my right to make that is simply the universal right of a man to enlighten a woman when he sees her unconsciously placed in a false position.' Lily smiled. "'I suppose,' she rejoined, "'that by a false position you mean one outside of what we call society.' But you must remember that I had been excluded from those sacred precincts long before I met Mrs. Hatch. As far as I can see, there is very little real difference in being inside or out. And I remember your once telling me that it was only those inside who took the difference seriously." She had not been without intention in making this allusion to their memorable talk at Bellamont, and she waited with an odd tremor of the nerves to see what response it would bring. But the result of the experiment was disappointing. Selden did not allow the illusion to deflect him from his point. He merely said with completer fullness of emphasis, "'The question of being inside or out is, as you say, a small one, and it happens to have nothing to do with the case, except in so far as Mrs. Hatch's desire to be inside may put you in the position I call false.' In spite of the moderation of his tone, each word he spoke had the effect of confirming Lily's resistance. The very apprehensions he aroused hardened her against him. She had been on the alert for the note of personal sympathy, for any sign of recovered power over him, and his attitude of sober impartiality, the absence of all response to her appeal, turned her hurt pride to blind resentment of his interference. The conviction that he had been sent by Gertie, and that whatever straits he conceived her to be in, he would never voluntarily have come to her aid, strengthened her resolve not to admit him a hair's breadth farther into her confidence. However doubtful she might feel her situation to be, she would rather persist in darkness than owe her enlightenment to Selden. "'I don't know,' she said, when he had ceased to speak, "'why you imagine me to be situated as you describe. But as you have always told me that the sole object of a bringing up like mine was to teach a girl to get what she wants, why not assume that that is precisely what I am doing?' The smile with which she summed up her case was like a clear barrier raised against farther confidences. Its brightness held him at such a distance that he had a sense of being almost out of hearing as he rejoined, "'I am not sure that I have ever called you a successful example of that kind of bringing up.' Her colour rose a little at the implication, but she steeled herself with a light laugh. "'Ha! Ah, wait a little longer. 
Give me a little more time before you decide. And as he wavered before her, still watching for a break in the impenetrable front she presented, Don't give me up. I may still do credit to my training, she affirmed. End of chapter 9 The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton Book 2, Chapter 10 Look at those spangles, Miss Bart! Every one of them sewed on crooked! The tall forewoman, a pinched perpendicular figure, dropped the condemned structure of wire and net on the table at Lily's side, and passed on to the next figure in the line. There were twenty of them in the workroom, their fagged profiles, under exaggerated hair, bowed in the harsh north light above the utensils of their art. For it was something more than an industry, surely, this creation of ever-varied settings for the face of fortunate womanhood. Their own faces were sallow with the unwholesomeness of hot air and sedentary toil, rather than with any actual signs of want. They were employed in a fashionable millinery establishment and were fairly well clothed and well paid, but the youngest among them was as dull and colourless as the middle-aged. In the whole workroom there was only one skin beneath which the blood still visibly played, and that now burned with vexation, as Miss Bart, under the lash of the forewoman's comment, began to strip the hat-frame of its overlapping spangles. To Gertie Farish's hopeful spirit a solution appeared to have been reached when she remembered how beautifully Lily could trim hats. Instances of young lady milliners establishing themselves under fashionable patronage, and imparting to their creations that indefinable touch which the professional hand can never give, had flattered Gertie's visions of the future, and convinced even Lily that her separation from Mrs. Norma Hatch need not reduce her to dependence on her friends. The parting had occurred a few weeks after Selden's visit, and would have taken place sooner had it not been for the resistance set up in Lily by his ill-starred offer of advice. The sense of being involved in a transaction she would not have cared to examine too closely, had soon afterward to find itself in the light of a hint from Mr. Stancy that, if she saw them through, she would have no reason to be sorry. The implication that such loyalty would meet with a direct reward had hastened her flight, and flung her back, ashamed and penitent, on the broad bosom of Gertie's sympathy. She did not, however, propose to lie there prone and Gertie's inspiration about the hats at once revived her hopes of profitable activity. Here was, after all, something that her charming listless hands could really do. She had no doubt of their capacity for knotting a ribbon, or placing a flower to advantage. And, of course, only these finishing touches would be expected of her. Subordinate fingers, blunt, grey, needle-pricked fingers, would prepare the shapes and stitch the linings, while she presided over the charming little front shop a shop all white panels, mirrors, and moss-green hangings, where her finished creations, hats, wreaths, aigrettes, and the rest, perched on their stands like birds just poising for flight. But at the very outset of Gertie's campaign this vision of the green and white shop had been dispelled. Other young ladies of fashion had been thus set up, selling their hats by the mere attraction of a name and the reputed knack of tying a bow. But these privileged beings could command a faith in their powers materially expressed by the readiness to pay their shop-rent, and advance a handsome sum for current expenses. Where was Lily to find such support? And even could it have been found? How were the ladies on whose approval she depended to be induced to give her their patronage? Gertie learned that whatever sympathy her friend's case might have excited a few months since, had been imperiled, if not lost, by her association with Mrs. Hatch. Once again, Lily had withdrawn from an ambiguous situation in time to save her self-respect, but too late for public vindication. Freddy Van Osburgh was not to marry Mrs. Hatch. He had been rescued at the eleventh hour, some said by the efforts of Gus Trenner and Rosedale, and dispatched to Europe with old Ned Van Alstyne. But the risk he had run would always be ascribed to Miss Bart's connivance and would somehow serve as a summing up and corroboration of the vague general distrust of her. It was a relief to those who had hung back from her to find themselves thus justified, and they were inclined to insist a little on her connection with the Hatch case, in order to show that they had been right. Gertie's quest, at any rate, brought up against a solid wall of resistance, and even when Carrie Fisher, momentarily penitent for her share in the Hatch affair, 
joined her efforts to Miss Farish's. They met with no better success. Gertie had tried to veil her failure in tender ambiguities. But Carrie, always the soul of candor, put the case squarely to her friend. I went straight to Judy Trenner. She has fewer prejudices than the others, and besides, she's always hated Bertha Dorset. But what have you done to her, Lily? At the very first word about giving you a start, she flamed out about some money you'd got from Gus. I never knew her so hot before. You know she'll let him do anything but spend money on his friends. The only reason she's decent to me now is that she knows I'm not hard up. He speculated for you, you say? Well, what's the harm? He had no business to lose. He didn't lose. Then what on earth? But I never could understand you, Lily. The end of it was that after anxious enquiry and much deliberation, Mrs. Fisher and Gertie, for once oddly united in their effort to help their friend, decided on placing her in the workroom of Madame Regina's renowned millinery establishment. Even this arrangement was not effected without considerable negotiation, for Madame Regina had a strong prejudice against untrained assistance, and was induced to yield only by the fact that she owed the patronage of Mrs. Bry and Mrs. Gormer to Carrie Fisher's influence. She had been willing from the first to employ Lily in the showroom. As a displayer of hats, a fashionable beauty might be a valuable asset. But to this suggestion Miss Bart opposed a negative, which Gertie emphatically supported, while Mrs. Fisher, inwardly unconvinced, but resigned to this latest proof of Lily's unreason, agreed that perhaps in the end it would be more useful that she should learn the trade. To Regina's workroom Lily was therefore committed by her friends, and there Mrs. Fisher left her with a sigh of relief, while Gertie's watchfulness continued to hover over her at a distance. Lily had taken up her work early in January. It was now two months later, and she was still being rebuked for her inability to sew spangles on a hat-frame. As she returned to her work, she heard a titter pass down the tables. She knew she was an object of criticism and amusement to the other workwomen. They were, of course, aware of her history. The exact situation of every girl in the room was known and freely discussed by all the others. But the knowledge did not produce in them any awkward sense of class distinction. It merely explained why her untutored fingers were still blundering over the rudiments of the trade. Lily had no desire that they should recognize any social difference in her. But she had hoped to be received as their equal, and perhaps before long to show herself their superior by a special deftness of touch. And it was humiliating to find that, after two months of drudgery, she still betrayed her lack of early training. Remote was the day when she might aspire to exercise the talents she felt confident of possessing. Only experienced workers were entrusted with the delicate art of shaping and trimming the hat, and the four women still held her inexorably to the routine of preparatory work. She began to rip the spangles from the frame, listening absently to the buzz of talk which rose and fell with the coming and going of Miss Haines' active figure. The air was closer than usual, because Miss Haines, who had a cold, had not allowed a window to be opened even during the noon recess, and Lily's head was so heavy with the weight of a sleepless night that the chatter of her companions had the incoherence of a dream. "'I told her he'd never look at her again, and he didn't. I wouldn't have either. I think she acted real mean to him. He took her to the Aryan Ball, and had a hack for her both ways. She'd taken ten bottles, and her headaches don't seem no better, but she's written a testimonial to say the first bottle cured her, and she got five dollars and her picture in the paper. Mrs. Trenner's hat, the one with the green paradise. Here, Miss Haynes, it'll be ready right off. That was one of the Trenner girls here yesterday with Mrs. George Dorset. How'd I know? Why, Madam sent for me to alter the flower in that Vero hat, the blue tulle. She's tall and slight, with her hair fuzzed out. A good deal like Mamie Leach, only thinner. On and on it flowed, a current of meaningless sound, on which, startlingly enough, a familiar name now and then floated to the surface. It was the strangest part of Lily's strange experience, the hearing of these names, the seeing the fragmentary and distorted image of the world she had lived in reflected in the mirror of the working girl's minds. She had never before suspected the mixture of insatiable curiosity and contemptuous freedom with which she and her kind were discussed in this underworld of toilers who lived on their vanity and self-indulgence. Every girl in Madame Regina's workroom knew to whom the headgear in her hands was destined, 
and had her opinion of its future wearer, and a definite knowledge of the latter's place in the social system. That Lily was a star fallen from that sky did not, after the first stir of curiosity had subsided, materially add to their interest in her. She had fallen, she had gone under, and true to the ideal of their race, they were awed only by success, by the gross, tangible image of material achievement. The consciousness of her different point of view merely kept them at a little distance from her, as though she were a foreigner with whom it was an effort to talk. "'Miss Bart, if you can't sew those spangles on more regular, I guess you'd better give the hat to Miss Kilroy.' Lily looked down ruefully at her handiwork. The forewoman was right. The sewing on of the spangles was inexcusably bad. What made her so much more clumsy than usual? Was it a growing distaste for her task, or actual physical disability? She felt tired and confused. It was an effort to put her thoughts together. She rose and handed the hat to Miss Kilroy, who took it with a suppressed smile. "'I'm sorry. I'm afraid I am not well,' she said to the forewoman. Miss Haynes offered no comment. From the first she had augured ill of Madame Regina's consenting to include a fashionable apprentice among her workers. In that temple of art no raw beginners were wanted, and Miss Haynes would have been more than human had she not taken a certain pleasure in seeing her forebodings confirmed. "'You'd better go back to binding edges,' she said dryly. Lily slipped out last among the band of liberated workwomen. She did not care to be mingled in their noisy dispersal. Once in the street, she always felt an irresistible return to her old standpoint, an instinctive shrinking from all that was unpolished and promiscuous. In the days—how distant they now seemed—when she had visited the girls' club with Gertie Farish, she had felt an enlightened interest in the working classes. But that was because she looked down on them from above, from the happy altitude of her grace and her beneficence. Now that she was on a level with them, the point of view was less interesting. She felt a touch on her arm, and met the penitent eye of Miss Kilroy. "'Miss Bart, I guess you can sew those spangles on as well as I can when you're feeling right. Miss Haynes didn't act fair to you.' Lily's colour rose at the unexpected advance. It was a long time since real kindness had looked out at her from any eyes but Gertie's. "'Oh, thank you. I'm not particularly well. But Miss Haynes was right. I am clumsy.' "'Well, it's mean work for anybody with a headache.' Miss Kilroy paused irresolutely. "'You ought to go right home and lay down. Ever try Orangine?' "'Thank you.' Lily held out her hand. "'It's very kind of you. I mean to go home.' She looked gratefully at Miss Kilroy, but neither knew what more to say. Lily was aware that the other was on the point of offering to go home with her, but she wanted to be alone and silent. Even kindness, the sort of kindness that Miss Kilroy could give, would have jarred on her just then. "'Thank you,' she repeated as she turned away. She struck westward through the dreary March twilight, toward the street where her boarding-house stood. She had resolutely refused Gertie's offer of hospitality. Something of her mother's fierce shrinking from observation and sympathy was beginning to develop in her, and the promiscuity of small quarters and close intimacy seemed, on the whole, less endurable than the solitude of a hall bedroom, in a house where she could come and go unremarked among other workers. For a while she had been sustained by this desire for privacy and independence. But now, perhaps from increasing physical weariness, the lassitude brought about by hours of unwonted confinement, she was beginning to feel acutely the ugliness and discomfort of her surroundings. The day's task done, she dreaded to return to her narrow room, with its blotched wallpaper and shabby paint, and she hated every step of the walk thither, through the degradation of a New York street in the last stages of decline from fashion to commerce. But what she dreaded most of all was having to pass the chemists at the corner of Sixth Avenue. She had meant to take another street. She had usually done so of late. But to-day her steps were irresistibly drawn toward the flaring plate-glass corner. She tried to take the lower crossing, but a laden dray crowded her back, and she struck across the street obliquely, reaching the sidewalk just opposite the chemist's door. 
Over the counter she caught the eye of the clerk who had waited on her before, and slipped the prescription into his hand. There could be no question about the prescription. It was a copy of one of Mrs. Hatch's, obligingly furnished by that lady's chemist. Lily was confident that the clerk would fill it without hesitation. Yet the nervous dread of a refusal, or even of an expression of doubt, communicated itself to her restless hands, as she affected to examine the bottles of perfume stacked on the glass case before her. The clerk had read the prescription without comment, but in the act of handing out the bottle he paused. "'You don't want to increase the dose, you know,' he remarked. Lily's heart contracted. What did he mean by looking at her in that way? "'Of course not,' she murmured, holding out her hand. "'That's all right. It's a queer-acting drug. A drop or two more, and off you go. The doctors don't know why.' The dread, lest he should question her, or keep the bottle back, choked the murmur of acquiescence in her throat, and when at length she emerged safely from the shop, she was almost dizzy with the intensity of her relief. The mere touch of the packet thrilled her tired nerves with the delicious promise of a night of sleep, and in the reaction from her momentary fear, she felt as if the first fumes of drowsiness were already stealing over her. In her confusion, she stumbled against a man who was hurrying down the last steps of the elevated station. He drew back, and she heard her name uttered with surprise. It was Rosedale, fur-coated, glossy, and prosperous. But why did she seem to see him so far off? and as if through a mist of splintered crystals. Before she could account for the phenomenon, she found herself shaking hands with him. They had parted with scorn on her side and anger upon his, but all trace of these emotions seemed to vanish as their hands met, and she was only aware of a confused wish that she might continue to hold fast to him. "'Why, what's the matter, Miss Lily? You're not well!' he exclaimed, and she forced her lips into a pallid smile of reassurance. "'I'm a little tired.' "'It's nothing. Stay with me a moment, please,' she faltered. "'That she should be asking this service of Rosedale.' He glanced at the dirty and unpropitious corner on which they stood, with the shriek of the elevated and the tumult of trams and wagons contending hideously in their ears. "'We can't stay here. But let me take you somewhere for a cup of tea. The Longworth is only a few yards off, and there'll be no one there at this hour.' A cup of tea in quiet, somewhere out of the noise and ugliness, seemed for the moment the one solace she could bear. A few steps brought them to the lady's door of the hotel he had named, and a moment later he was seated opposite to her, and the waiter had placed the tea-tray between them. "'Not a drop of brandy or whisky first. You look regularly done up, Miss Lily. Well, take your tea strong, then. And, waiter, get a cushion for the lady's back.' Lily smiled faintly at the injunction to take her tea strong. It was the temptation she was always struggling to resist. Her craving for the keen stimulant was forever conflicting with that other craving for sleep, the midnight craving which only the little phial in her hand could still. But to-day, at any rate, the tea could hardly be too strong. She counted on it to pour warmth and resolution into her empty veins. As she leaned back before him, her lids drooping in utter lassitude, Though the first warm draught already tinged her face with returning life, Rosedale was seized afresh by the poignant surprise of her beauty. The dark pencilling of fatigue under her eyes, the morbid blue-veined pallor of the temples, brought out the brightness of her hair and lips, as though all her ebbing vitality were centred there. Against the dull chocolate-coloured background of the restaurant, the purity of her head stood out as it had never done in the most brightly lit ballroom. He looked at her with a startled, uncomfortable feeling, as though her beauty were a forgotten enemy that had lain in ambush, and now sprang out on him unawares. To clear the air he tried to take an easy tone with her. "'Why, Miss Lily, I haven't seen you for an age. I didn't know what had become of you.' As he spoke, he was checked by an embarrassing sense of the complications to which this might lead. Though he had not seen her, he had heard of her. He knew of her connection with Mrs. Hatch— and of the talk resulting from it. Mrs. Hatch's milieu was one which she had once assiduously frequented, and now as devoutly shunned. Lily, to whom the tea had restored her usual clearness of mind, saw what was in his thoughts, and said with a slight smile, "'You would not be likely to know about me. I have joined the working classes.' He stared in genuine wonder. "'You don't mean—' 
Why, what on earth are you doing? Learning to be a milliner. At least, trying to learn. She hastily qualified the statement. Rosedale suppressed a low whistle of surprise. Come off! You ain't serious, are you? Perfectly serious. I'm obliged to work for my living. But I understood. I thought you were with Norma Hatch. You heard I had gone to her as her secretary. Something of the kind, I believe. He leaned forward to refill her cup. Lily guessed the possibilities of embarrassment which the topic held for him, and raising her eyes to his, she said suddenly, I left her two months ago. Rosedale continued to fumble awkwardly with the teapot, and she felt sure that he had heard what had been said of her. But what was there that Rosedale did not hear? "'Wasn't it a soft berth? he inquired, with an attempt at lightness. "'Too soft. One might have sunk in too deep.' Lily rested one arm on the edge of the table, and sat looking at him more intently than she had ever looked before. An uncontrollable impulse was urging her to put her case to this man, from whose curiosity she had always so fiercely defended herself. "'You know Mrs. Hatch, I think.' Well, perhaps you can understand that she might make things too easy for one. Rosedale looked faintly puzzled, and she remembered that elusiveness was lost on him. It was no place for you, anyhow, he agreed, so suffused and immersed in the light of her full gaze that he found himself being drawn into strange depths of intimacy. He, who had had to subsist on mere fugitive glances, looks winged in flight and swiftly lost under covert, now found her eyes settling on him with a brooding intensity that fairly dazzled him. "'I left,' Lily continued, "'lest people should say I was helping Mrs. Hatch to marry Freddy Van Osburgh, who is not in the least too good for her, and as they still continue to say it, I see that I might as well have stayed where I was.' "'Oh, Freddy!' Rosedale brushed aside the topic with an air of its unimportance, which gave a sense of the immense perspective he had acquired. "'Freddy don't count. But I knew you weren't mixed up in that. It ain't your style.' Lily coloured slightly. She could not conceal from herself that the words gave her pleasure. She would have liked to sit there, drinking more tea, and continuing to talk of herself to Rosedale. But the old habit of observing the conventions reminded her that it was time to bring their colloquy to an end, and she made a faint motion to push back her chair. Rosedale stopped her with a protesting gesture. "'Wait a minute. Don't go yet. Sit quiet and rest a little longer. You look thoroughly played out. And you haven't told me—' He broke off, conscious of going farther than he had meant. He saw the struggle and understood it, understood also the nature of the spell to which he yielded as, with his eyes on her face, he began again abruptly. "'What on earth did you mean by saying just now that you were learning to be a milliner?' "'Just what I said. I am an apprentice at Regina's.' "'Good Lord! You? But what for? I knew your aunt had turned you down. Mrs. Fisher told me about it. But I understood you got a legacy from her.' "'I got ten thousand dollars. But the legacy is not to be paid till next summer.' Well, but look here, you could borrow on it any time you wanted. She shook her head gravely. No, for I owe it already. Owe it? The whole ten thousand? Every penny. She paused and then continued abruptly, with her eyes on his face. I think Gus Trenner spoke to you once about having made some money for me in stocks. She waited, and Rosedale, congested with embarrassment, muttered that he remembered something of the kind. He made about nine thousand dollars, Lily pursued, in the same tone of eager communicativeness. At the time, I understood that he was speculating with my own money. It was incredibly stupid of me, but I knew nothing of business. Afterward I found out that he had not used my money, that what he said he had made for me he had really given me. It was meant in kindness, of course, but it was not the sort of obligation one could remain under. Unfortunately, I had spent the money before I discovered my mistake, and so my legacy will have to go to pay it back. That is the reason why I am trying to learn a trade." She made the statement clearly, deliberately, with pauses between the sentences, so that each should have time to sink deeply into the hearer's mind. 
She had a passionate desire that some one should know the truth about this transaction, and also that the rumour of her intention to repay the money should reach Judy Trenner's ears. And it suddenly occurred to her that Rosedale, who had surprised Trenner's confidence, was the fitting person to receive and transmit her version of the facts. She had even felt a momentary exhilaration at the thought of thus relieving herself of her detested secret. But the sensation gradually faded in the telling, and as she ended her pallor was suffused with a deep blush of misery. Rosedale continued to stare at her in wonder, but the wonder took the turn she had least expected. "'But see here, if that's the case, it cleans you out altogether.' He put it to her as if she had not grasped the consequences of her act, as if her incorrigible ignorance of business were about to precipitate her into a fresh act of folly. Altogether, yes, she calmly agreed. He sat silent, his thick hands clasped on the table, his little puzzled eyes exploring the recesses of the deserted restaurant. "'See here, that's fine!' he exclaimed abruptly. Lily rose from her seat with a deprecating laugh. "'Oh, no, it's merely a bore,' she asserted, gathering together the ends of her feather scarf. Rosedale remained seated, too intent on his thoughts to notice her movement. "'Miss Lily, if you want any backing—I like pluck,' broke from him disconnectedly. "'Thank you,' she held out her hand. "'Your tea has given me a tremendous backing. I feel equal to anything now.' Her gesture seemed to show a definite intention of dismissal, but her companion had tossed a bill to the waiter, and was slipping his short arms into his expensive overcoat. "'Wait a minute. You've got to let me walk home with you,' he said. Lily uttered no protest, and when he had paused to make sure of his change, they emerged from the hotel and crossed Sixth Avenue again. As she led the way westward past a long line of areas which, through the distortion of their paintless rails, Revealed with increasing candor the disjecta membra of bygone dinners, Lily felt that Rosedale was taking contemptuous note of the neighborhood, and before the doorstep at which she finally paused, he looked up with an air of incredulous disgust. "'This isn't the place. Some one told me you were living with Miss Farish.' "'No. I am boarding here. I have lived too long on my friends.' He continued to scan the blistered brown stone front the windows draped with discoloured lace, and the Pompeian decoration of the muddy vestibule. Then he looked back at her face, and said with a visible effort, "'You let me come and see you some day.' She smiled, recognising the heroism of the offer to the point of being frankly touched by it. "'Thank you. I shall be very glad,' she made answer, in the first sincere word she had ever spoken to him. That evening in her own room Miss Bart— who had fled early from the heavy fumes of the basement dinner-table, sat musing upon the impulse which had led her to unbosom herself to Rosedale. Beneath it she discovered an increasing sense of loneliness, a dread of returning to the solitude of her room, while she could be anywhere else, or in any company but her own. Circumstances of late had combined to cut her off more and more from her few remaining friends. On Carrie Fisher's part the withdrawal was perhaps not quite involuntary. Having made her final effort on Lily's behalf, and landed her safely in Madame Regina's workroom, Mrs. Fisher seemed disposed to rest from her labours, and Lily, understanding the reason, could not condemn her. Carrie had, in fact, come dangerously near to being involved in the episode of Mrs. Norma Hatch, and it had taken some verbal ingenuity to extricate herself. She frankly owned to having brought Lily and Mrs. Hatch together, but then she did not know Mrs. Hatch. She had expressly warned Lily that she did not know Mrs. Hatch, and besides, she was not Lily's keeper, and really the girl was old enough to take care of herself. Carrie did not put her own case so brutally, but she allowed it to be thus put for her by her latest bosom friend, Mrs. Jack Stepney. Mrs. Stepney, trembling over the narrowness of her only brother's escape, but eager to vindicate Mrs. Fisher, at whose house she could count on the jolly parties, which had become a necessity to her since marriage had emancipated her from the Van Osburgh point of view. Lily understood the situation, and could make allowances for it. Carrie had been a good friend to her in difficult days, and perhaps only a friendship like Gertie's could be proof against such an increasing strain. Gertie's friendship did indeed hold fast. Yet Lily was beginning to avoid her also, for she could not go to Gertie's without risk of meeting Selden, 
and to meet him now would be pure pain. It was pain enough even to think of him, whether she considered him in the distinctness of her waking thoughts, or felt the obsession of his presence through the blur of her tormented nights. That was one of the reasons why she had turned again to Mrs. Hatch's prescription. In the uneasy snatches of her natural dreams, he came to her sometimes in the old guise of fellowship and tenderness, and she would rise from the sweet delusion mocked and emptied of her courage. But in the sleep which the file procured, she sank far below such half-waking visitations, sank into depths of dreamless annihilation, from which she woke each morning with an obliterated past. Gradually, to be sure, the stress of the old thoughts would return, but at least they did not importune her waking hour. The drug gave her a momentary illusion of complete renewal, from which she drew strength to take up her daily work. That strength was more and more needed as the perplexities of her future increased. She knew that to Gertie and Mrs. Fisher she was only passing through a temporary period of probation, since they believed that the apprenticeship she was serving at Madame Regina's would enable her, when Mrs. Peniston's legacy was paid, to realize the vision of the green and white shop with the fuller competence acquired by her preliminary training. But to Lily herself, aware that the legacy could not be put to such a use, the preliminary training seemed a wasted effort. She understood clearly enough that, even if she could never learn to compete with hands formed from childhood for their special work, the small pay she received would not be a sufficient addition to her income to compensate her for such drudgery. And the realization of this fact brought her recurringly face to face with the temptation to use the legacy in establishing her business. Once installed, and in command of her own workwomen, she believed she had sufficient tact and ability to attract a fashionable clientele, and if the business succeeded she could gradually lay aside enough money to discharge her debt to Trenner. But the task might take years to accomplish, even if she continued to stint herself to the utmost, and meanwhile her pride would be crushed under the weight of an intolerable obligation. These were her superficial considerations, but under them lurked the secret dread that the obligation might not always remain intolerable. She knew she could not count on her continuity of purpose, and what really frightened her was the thought that she might gradually accommodate herself to remaining indefinitely in Trenner's debt, as she had accommodated herself to the part allotted her on the Sabrina, and as she had so nearly drifted into acquiescing with Stancy's scheme for the advancement of Mrs. Hatch. Her danger lay, as she knew, in her old incurable dread of discomfort and poverty, in the fear of that mounting tide of dinginess against which her mother had so passionately warned her. And now a new vista of peril opened before her. She understood that Rosedale was ready to lend her money, and the longing to take advantage of his offer began to haunt her insidiously. It was, of course, impossible to accept a loan from Rosedale, but proximate possibilities hovered temptingly before her. She was quite sure that he would come and see her again, and almost sure that, if he did, she could bring him to the point of offering to marry her on the terms she had previously rejected. Would she still reject them if they were offered? More and more, with every fresh mischance befalling her, did the pursuing furies seem to take the shape of Bertha Dorset, and close at hand, safely locked among her papers, lay the means of ending their pursuit. The temptation, which her scorn of Rosedale had once enabled her to reject, now insistently returned upon her, and how much strength was left her to oppose it! What little there was must at any rate be husbanded to the utmost. She could not trust herself again to the perils of a sleepless night. Through the long hours of silence the dark spirit of fatigue and loneliness crouched upon her breast, leaving her so drained of bodily strength that her morning thoughts swam in a haze of weakness. The only hope of renewal lay in the little bottle at her bedside, and how much longer that hope would last she dared not conjecture. End of chapter 10